Hello, I'm Adrian Finnegan. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, Trump's deal of the century, a $50 billion plan to kickstart a moribund Israeli-Palestinian peace process, but not a single dollar pledged. I'm Dominic Kane at the German car plant where the electric revolution is driving petrol-powered people's cars to the end of the line. And we find out if there's enough lithium to power the world's ambition to go electric. President Trump promised the deal of the century to bring peace between Israelis and Palestinians. His son-in-law and White House advisor Jared Kushner delivered an economic roadmap he called the opportunity of the century. The proposal was roundly dismissed by Palestinians and many others. The plans called for $50 billion in investments over 10 years. $28 billion would go to the Palestinian territories in Gaza and the Israeli-occupied West Bank. The rest to be split between Jordan, Egypt and Lebanon. It's hoped the money would help to double the Palestinian economy, creating one million jobs in the process. That should reduce the Palestinian unemployment rate to nearly single digits and lower the Palestinian poverty rate by 50%. So... Who's writing that $50 billion check? Well, Kushner had hoped the Gulf states and private investors would see the benefit of the 179 proposed infrastructure and business projects, including a $5 billion corridor to connect the West Bank and Gaza. But the plan was never going to fly without a political solution. Longtime campaigner Hanan Hashrawi was typical of the pushback against the proposal, saying the Palestinians were capable of building a vibrant, prosperous economy as a free and sovereign people. For his part, Kushner, in an interview with Al Jazeera, offered a glimpse of what the political process could look like. I think we all have to recognize that if there ever is a deal, it's not going to be along the lines of the Arab Peace Initiative. It will be somewhere between the Arab Peace Initiative and somewhere between the Israeli position. And we need to think about what are the fundamental things that are underlying and important. Number one is security, right? I think the Israeli population and the Palestinian population and the broader Middle East right now cares a lot about have security. The more you have security, the more you could have freer flow of goods, freer flow of people. I know that's a very big issue for the Palestinians. But as Nida Ibrahim reports from the occupied West Bank, Palestinians say that financial incentives alone can't solve a decades-old conflict. Israeli restrictions on Palestinian businesses are so tight, even salt can't sift through. The only Palestinian salt factory is feeling the pinch. Palestinian businessman Hussam al-Hallaq believes his company's problems cannot be solved by economic incentives only. This is a military area, so we're restricted in getting any type of uh, permits to, uh, to expand with existing buildings. Things that we want is not giveaways, but actually business opportunities. Not only does the company need Israeli coordination to pump water from the Dead Sea, it also takes him a lot of time and money to export the salt using Israeli controlled ports. The factory that employs 25 workers is the only Palestinian owned business on the shores of the Dead Sea and has hardly changed or been improved since it started in the early 1960s. Owners need Israeli permission before they can build any structure in this area. Sometimes they never get it. It took Hussam al-Hallaq 30 years before the go-ahead was given to build this showroom. The factory is the main source of salt for Palestinians, including many businesses in the occupied West Bank. Like many other Palestinian businesses, the owner of this food pickling business says profits could triple if he had unrestricted access to land and water, as well as free movement of products. Israel controls all water supplies in the West Bank. The Palestinian Water Authority estimates that Palestinians can only use 15% of their water resources. Israelis use the remaining 85%. In a further restriction to cripple the economy, the Israeli government restricts Palestinians from using 60% of the land in the West Bank to build factories or anything else. The core of the crisis goes back to the establishment of the Palestinian Authority. The obligations of the people in the occupied territory has been transferred to the Palestinian Authority. At the same time, it inherited a weak economy. Israel's deduction of tax revenues, which it collects on behalf of the Palestinian Authority, is at the heart of the Authority's financial crisis. That, says Palestinians, coupled with reduced aid from foreign donors, as well as the long-standing restrictions on businesses, further blocks the road to economic progress. 
Joining us now from Ramallah is Mazen Sinekrot. Mazen's a former economy minister for the Palestinian Authority, a businessman. He currently serves as the chief executive of Sinekrot Global Group. Welcome uh, to Counting the Cost. One of the main criticisms of the proposals put forward by Jared Kushner was that it was presented in a, a glossy Manhattan real estate brochure style that lifted ideas from USA, the very programmes pulled by Trump, the, the World Bank, uh, and McKinsey reports, um, as a former economy minister, but more importantly as a businessman, what did you make of it? Well, let's try to, to speak about some realities. Uh, Palestine actually has an infant small economy. Our uh, GDP is less than $14 billion a year. It's actually like a size of a medium to large company in the US or in the Gulf region. Uh, uh, all international uh, and local uh, studies have stated very clearly uh, that, uh, that actually uh, Palestine economy has been very well identified by these international uh, agencies and companies uh, from outside and from inside Palestine. But everybody agrees that uh, such kind of uh, economy can hardly grow uh, under occupation uh, because the obstacles have been identified, the constraints have been identified, and the limitation and, uh, and the very limited corridors and margins for us to grow has been also very limited. So we believe it's not only to do a study. The studies have been made in hundreds by these international experts around the world, and they have been very well identified what's going on. So I don't think that we are very much in need for new studies to be launched, neither by the current American administration nor by others. USID also has some, some studies. The World Bank have stated very clearly in their regular reports, if the siege on the West Bank and Gaza is lifted, the Palestinian economy can grow on 15 percent yearly. And if the Israelis will uh, also make access for Palestinians to, to, uh, to expand their businesses and social life in the Jordan Valley, we can easily create another 100,000 jobs. So at the end, it's issue related to occupation and the measures on the ground by occupiers. So you can't have an economic deal without a political one alongside it? Definitely, that's, that's, true. that's do, true. Do any of these infrastructure proposals actually make sense? $500 million for a, for a university, $5 billion to link Gaza and the West Bank. Look, I mean, for us uh, uh, business people, we understand that uh, strategic infra uh, infrastructure projects go in line with the state building. If there is no state building measures to, for Palestine to have sovereignty on its land, on its territories, What's really the main objective of having a strategic projects or an infrastructure project? This is from one hand. From the other hand, Palestine today has 15 local universities with 240,000 students, and they have been doing very well. We are, we are in need for vocational uh, colleges and training vocational uh, students. This is something else, which I agree about that. Also, the corridor between the West Bank and Gaza, Palestine is very much in need to, to tie the geography, the, 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 the geography of Palestinians together. And there was a study being made in 2005 also by the World Bank for this corridor or a tunnel or a sunken road or a bridge. So options were stated, but not with this amount of money. How do you think Palestinian donors, countries like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Qatar, feel about these proposals? Would they, do you think, try to pressure the Palestinian Authority at least into giving it a, a good hard look? Look, uh, you, uh, international agencies, including some of the Arab countries or investors, they always seek impact for their investment. So they can hardly see impact under occupation, and they need to identify the projects they are investing in. And they need to come and see and monitor and supervise the projects they would like to do in, in, in countries like Palestine. But having Israel in control of the borders for those who wants to come in or for those who wants to leave and getting a visa from the Israelis, Usually, this is not uh, the way to do business and, and really to encourage investments from the Gulf region for, for Palestine. Palestinians in diaspora, they have been trying their utmost during the last 50 years or so since occupation in 1967. Till today, I can tell you the amount of money came from Palestinians in diaspora is extremely uh, little. Uh, and uh, because the Palestinians in diaspora wealth uh, is exceeding $80 billion, in addition to the Arabs and others who would like to see that uh, would like to share the future for Palestinians and to really build the Palestinian state and to be part of future building for, for, the, for, for the Palestinians. So as far as but you're without concerned... without having access... Sorry. Yeah, without having really uh, uh, an, an ease access of coming in and going out, how can this happen?
So as far as you're concerned, Jared Kushner's plan as it is, is dead in the water. It's a non-starter. Well, I don't want to say that it was born dead, but I think it was a good exercise for uh, Kushner, who has been new for the region, uh, to understand what's been going on. And I really watch uh, part of the sessions in Manama over, over Al Jazeera uh, Live. And uh, most of the people have spoken loudly about the limitation for economic growth under occupation. And without a political will, we don't see that things can happen on the ground. So you can hardly decouple politics from economics. This should be well known and realized by Kushner and the current American administration. So talking about, about uh, political, security, prosperity, these are the priorities for Palestine. They should go in order. Political, security, prosperity. Without political will, you can hardly have security on the ground, nor prosperity under occupation. Good to talk to you so many. Thanks indeed for being with us. Thank you. Now, diesel was supposed to be the future, but the German car industry has paid and continues to count the cost of promoting the fuel after regulators caught some in the industry cheating on emissions tests. Now it's spending billions to go electric, but the cost could be tens of thousands of job losses. The German auto industry employs 1.8 million people directly and indirectly. Livelihoods are threatened because electric cars don't need complicated combustion engines leading to the loss of more than 100,000 jobs by 2035. For the economy, the German car industry is a big earner, bringing in $500 billion annually. To keep its global leadership, BMW, Daimler and VW will spend $45 billion on electric vehicle technology over the next three years. For its part, Volkswagen says its last fossil fuel-based car will be released in 2026, but environmentalists say that's too little too late. They want all manufacturers to phase out polluting engines by 2028. So, how realistic is this? Out of Dominic Kane has been to a car plant in eastern Germany to find out. This is the production line at the Volkswagen plant in Zwickau where the robotic and human workforce combine to assemble more than 300,000 vehicles every year. For decades, virtually all the people's cars produced here have been powered by petrol engines. But not for much longer. Now, electric is the buzzword. We are convinced that not just German drivers, but also European ones are ready for this, and we are ready to roll out these cars to the whole world. Why? Because an electric car is not a compromise. They have everything that a car needs, maybe even a little more. They can be more dynamic with better driving characteristics. You get a good sense of the differences between the vehicles when you look inside their chassis stripped down as they are here. This is the conventionally powered Golf. Look at the central panel, which is clearly big to contain gear sticks and that sort of thing, those sorts of controls. But pan across to what we have here, the ID electrical car, no major central panel because batteries will be going where previously the sorts of machinery that were in the Golf were installed. This drive is part of a commitment from VW to phase out all fossil fuel powered cars by 2040. Leading environmental campaigners are demanding far more radical results. Hoarding onto the status quo is like hoarding on the sand on the beach. Time will slip between your hands and fingers and it will pass you by and you will be left with absolutely nothing but the mess in your hands. This sort of sentiment has fueled a surge in popularity for the Green Party across the continent, with the movement reaching clear success in May's European elections. In many people's minds are problems like these in Stuttgart, one of the most polluted cities in Germany, where levels of exhaust emissions regularly exceed safety limits and older diesel engines are already banned. We are making very clear, if you really want to make progress here, if you really want to make sure that the cities are cleaning up without doing any circulation ban, because that's what the conservatives hate, well, maybe then we have to clean up the cars. So then we need to put up policies in place for cleaning up the cars. That's the debate we're having, and we are hoping we can push it further. Which helps explain why the car makers are embracing the electric revolution, and why, for VW, fossil fuel powered cars will soon reach the end of the line. Dominic Kane, Al Jazeera, Zwickau.
Well, while German car makers are getting ready to spend billions on electric cars, one nation has stolen a march in the field. China's technology is considered to be miles ahead of its rivals. Our economics editor, Abed Ali, spoke to Alexander Close, the executive vice president of Chinese electric car maker Aways. He began by asking if its technology advantage was one reason for its plans to expand overseas, starting in Germany. Yes, uh, first of all, as we are a Chinese uh, company, and we're a very Chinese company, uh, I think I'm still the only foreigner in the company, uh, we think we have a very good foundation here in China where you actually have uh, a huge electrical vehicle market already. Uh, and we want to export that to other places where we think the development hasn't been as fast as it has been in China. That's why we think we have a certain advantage going to these places, namely first place to go to is Europe. And German companies are about to start spending 45 billion on electric cars and you have Tesla as another competitor. Are you well capitalised to be able to deal with that kind of uh, competition? We think uh, what we'll do, we offer a vehicle. We'll offer a vehicle plus uh, services around that vehicle in the European market, and we're well capitalised to do that. What others have to spend to actually convert all of their uh, existing assets into electric vehicles and do for electric vehicles is something completely different. We think we're very well equipped to go into the European market. And as we're all starting at the same time, we think we have actually a very good chance in that market. And why do you think Europeans would be interested in buying your cars? First of all, I have to say we won't sell these cars to Europeans, we just lease them. We want to make it as easy as possible for anybody who wants to go in the battery electric vehicle, and we think a lot of people do want to go into uh, battery electric vehicles. We want to make it very easy for them to get into this vehicle. So we will only lease them. There's no question about residual value, no question about warranty, no question about maintenance and so on. We'll make it very easy for everybody to get into these cars. We know that there is a lot of people who want to drive uh, a BEV and they just can't do so because all they get in the market at present is very expensive. Uh, it's going to be a risk because nobody knows what the residual value will be in a few years. Nobody knows what the battery will do and so on. We want to take all of that off and we think we have an offering that a lot of people will be interested in. But you've got companies like BYD, which is a Chinese company in Neo, which have sought international expansion but haven't made the transition yet. So where do you think you can improve on that? Everybody else has talked about, thought about it and so on. We're just going to do it. Uh, we think we have a product that is, uh, in terms of quality, ready for the European market. Uh, we think also that uh, we offer everything that the European customers would want to have. Uh, and that's why we're just going to jump over there, over to Europe. We think it's also the right time. Maybe a year ago, two years ago, uh, it wasn't the right time, but now it's the right time. Uh, there's a lot of people, literally, that are waiting for a car that they can afford, where they will have no risk to get into a battery electric vehicle and where they can just test this and we offer them that vehicle. Do you think electric cars are the future, especially when there is concern about range anxiety and China itself is considering hydrogen technology to, for long distances in particular? Yeah, for, first of all, we think that most of the customers in the market today uh, will actually not need a car for a very long distance. Uh, there is this uh, discussion about range anxiety, but we think it's uh, exaggerated. Uh, we still offer a car with a very long range and uh, to our knowledge, people will find out in a few years that maybe that range is even too much for them. So they could actually do with a smaller range. We still offer it today. Obviously, we don't want to offer something for everybody in the market right now. Uh, we're just offering one certain vehicle and uh, for a certain purpose. And we think that we have the right solution for that. What will be the solution for long-range travelling for somebody who has to tra uh, travel long-range every day is still in the open. We're doing our own research in that area 
and there is some, uh, some, let's say, some technologies which might be the right technologies for the future. But nobody knows that, uh, and uh, we are all still developing. For the time before that, and uh, also for a lot of the short-range travel, it's going to be battery electric vehicles. We're very convinced about that. Sales of cars are slowing in China, and we also have the threat of a, uh, a longer trade war with the United States. Just tell us what your feelings are as to where the industry is going in China itself. Yes, sales have been slowing in China, uh, but they have been slowing in certain segments and certain manufacturers. There have been other manufacturers which are still successful. Uh, we think there might be yeah, a, a flat market in the future, maybe. I mean, uh, you have seen that in, in other markets, that after a while the market will actually uh, tend to be a flat market. Uh, and maybe that's happening in, in China as well at some point in time. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to give you any forecast whether that will happen or whether that's now the time uh, that it will happen. I think for us, that's not really the question. We are a startup. Uh, we have a plant with a certain capacity, uh, which we want to fill in. We think we can fill that uh, capacity because it's only one small part of the market. So whilst the market has been slowing around us, uh, we don't think that's going to impact uh, our expansion in the future, particularly as we're also going abroad. As to the uh, potential trade war between China and the US, uh, as we're expanding in Europe first, uh, it's not going to impact us uh, for now. Uh, we're obviously also thinking about the US market, but that might be at a later stage. Alex Close, the Executive Vice President of Awe, is talking there to our business editor, Abit Ali. And I want to carry on some of the thoughts from that interview with our next guest. Joining us from London, Simon Moores, the Managing Director of Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. Uh, Simon, you are the leading provider of pricing data for lithium, key ingredient of uh, electric battery technology. But there are concerns that if the world was to start producing electric cars at the current rate of production, we could use up the world's resources within 17 to 40 years. Uh, what's missing from that analysis? Uh, quite a bit, really. I mean, lithium isn't rare. It's, the question is getting it out of the ground in economic quantities. And at the moment, the lithium industry has gone through a... Uh, surge in exploration and new development, but right now there's not, not as much investment going into the lithium industry to go beyond 2025. So the numbers you've quoted really are looking at uh, maybe minerals in the ground, but doesn't take into, uh, into account uh, production that's coming on stream and new exploration that's going to happen. But the takeaway point is lithium isn't geologically rare, but the challenge is getting it into the supply chain in economic quantities. You talk about uh, funding. Um... It's being held back, isn't it? Because investors just don't know how to price this, this mineral at the moment. They're looking for the likes of the London Metals Exchange to provide a tradable contract, just like copper and the like. But a lot of players within the industry don't particularly like to trade it that way. That's exactly right. So lithium is traded in private contracts between buyer and seller. And at Benchmark, we create an independent reference price to enable that supply chain to trade uh, with more clarity and more freedom than ever before. But as lithium grows, there's going to be new uh, ways to trade lithium contracts. And one was the London Metal Exchange. You have a, num a number of other exchanges looking at it as well. But lithium is a speciality chemical. It's going from the niche, a 300,000 ton a year industry, into the mainstream to about a million tons in the mid-2020s. And with that will come different ways to trade this. And when you're expanding that quickly in a market, lithium can't just rely on itself to expand anymore. It's going to need external capital. And the issue with that external capital is investors are, at present, too scared to put their money into it because either they don't understand lithium, it's too risky, it's too specialist, or the EV story is, for some, too good to be true. And I think that's the main challenge at the moment. So how do you go about pricing lithium? Uh, is it all about supply and demand? Yeah, it's, it's uh, very similar to any other commodity industry out there, although, I, as I say, it's a speciality chemical. Uh, but quite simply, if you know the lithium industry, you know the people that produce it, you know the intermediate companies, and you know the people that are buying this, uh, the range of speciality chemicals, 
which go under the bracket of lithium, then you can put together an independent reference price, an independent uh, benchmark price is what we're looking at in the next few years. And that then allows uh, new participants, especially such as battery companies and electric vehicle companies, which aren't used to buying lithium, it allows them to trade and to write contracts with more clarity than ever before. And that's really the role we play in the market. And where is lithium right now in terms of its price? I mean, it's come off, off its highs, hasn't it? It has, yeah. We saw a peak in lithium price really in 2017, and it's come down since last year, and it's carried on falling uh, before uh, even, even further. So the issue really is, um, the issue actually is getting the battery grade material into the supply chain. So lithium price hasn't, if you look at the average lithium prices, it hasn't actually crashed. The, the material within China has crashed, but the rest of the grades going into battery grade material, which is quite a specialist grade, and that's what's going to need to expand, has actually remained relatively high compared to historical levels. As you say, it's, it's not a rare mineral. As new uh, sources of lithium come online, uh, is there a danger that there might be uh, oversupply uh, and, and that could impact negatively uh, upon the price? How long does it get? Once you've got the investment, how long does it get these, these mines up and running? Yeah, it's a really good question because it takes anywhere between eight and ten years to build a lithium mine from scratch and to get it ramped up without any problems. And that's the biggest challenge for lithium. Um, the investment has gone into the mid-2020s, as I said, but really the, the surge in electric vehicle production is coming after that point. And there's a big question mark over where the money is going to come from for all these future lithium mines. But as I said, the exploration, people know these tier one lithium sources now. They understand the tier two sources. Uh, the question is if the money is going to be committed. And at the moment, it's not coming from the capital markets. It's coming from the industry itself. All right. For the moment, Chinese entities control nearly half of, of global lithium production and 60% of electric battery production capacity. Um, does that become a security concern for other nations? It has to, especially the US. I mean, when you look at for certain parts of the supply chain, should I, should I add, so when you look at the lithium... Uh, structure, you've got six big producers, two of which are Chinese, uh, two of which are actually American producers mining in South America. And uh, the question really isn't on the structure of the lithium industry. That kind of, that does operate in a, uh, a sensible, normal, uh, market-driven way. It's actually where this lithium-ion battery capacity is being built out. So we've, uh, we collect this data also at Benchmark and We've got 1.9 terawatt hours of battery capacity by 2029. It sounds a lot. It means about 35 million electric vehicles. But where is that capacity being built out? It's China. 67% of this battery capacity is in China. How much is in the US? It's about 8%. The question is, if you take Tesla and their huge gigafactory out of the equation, the number is 3%. So the US really uh, should be concerned about these supply chains, and it is playing catch up with China. Simon, really good to talk to you on Counting the Cost. Many thanks indeed for being with us. Simon Moores, Managing Director at Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. And that's our show for this week. If you'd like to comment on anything that you've seen, you can tweet me. I'm at A. Finnegan on Twitter. Please use the hashtag AJCTC when you do, or you could drop us a line. Counting the Cost at aljazeera.net is our email address. As always, there's plenty more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That takes you straight to our page, and there you'll find individual reports, links, even entire episodes for you to catch up on. But that's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Adrian Finnegan from the whole team here in Doha. Thanks for being with us. The news on Al Jazeera is next. <laughs>